John 4 tells the story we commonly refer to as the woman at the well. It's one of the most iconic encounters that Jesus had in the Gospels, but it starts simply. There was Jesus, there was a woman, and there was a well. Uh, let's consider this well for a moment. Scholars believe the well was 135 feet deep, which means every time this woman needed water, she had to pull a heavy bucket up over 13 stories to get a drink. Uh, I wonder if as she pulled that bucket up, she thought, this was my husband's job. He was the one who used to provide for me, but not anymore. She was abandoned and had to fend for herself. In fact, she had been abandoned by so many men that she didn't even talk to Jesus when she arrived. But before she can leave, Jesus asks, will you give me a drink? She answers, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. How can you ask me for a drink? These differences may not mean much to us, but imagine if she said, you're a Christian and I'm a Muslim. It was a divide clear to everyone in her day, everyone except Jesus. He explained, I asked you for a drink, but if you asked me for one, you will never be thirsty again. <laughs> this is an incredible claim. After all, we know science tells us that we cannot live without water. We're designed to drink liquids. It's necessary for our joints, our brain, our hearts, our digestive system. When we drink water, it literally zaps our body with life. If we don't drink it, we start to die. The woman likely did not fully understand the science behind drinking water, but she knew what it felt like to be thirsty. She told Jesus, you don't even have a bucket. Where are you going to get this water from? He said, if you drink the water I give you, you will never thirst again, but have a wellspring of eternal life. Think of how this must have sounded from her perspective. Jesus is sitting at a well with no bucket and talking to a Samaritan woman about eternal living water. She asked, where can I get this water so I don't have to come to the well anymore? And do you know how Jesus answered? He said, call your husband and come back. She said, I'm not married. And Jesus said, you're right, but you were married five times and the man you have now is not your husband. Now in this culture, a woman could not divorce her husband. That means she was abandoned five times, discarded five times. Imagine her eyes filling with tears, her head spinning as she asked Jesus, how did you know that? He goes on to explain that he is the Messiah and she knows it's true. She's not thinking about the water anymore. She's focused on Jesus. Now it's important to realize the woman in this story looks right past Jesus and focuses on her immediate need. This is something that happens to us all of the time. We're so busy with what we need in the moment that we look past the one who is the never ending source of life. We're so busy looking for something to eat that we forget the one who makes the plants grow. We are so busy looking for a bit of creative inspiration. We forget to look to the one who created everything. Yes, this woman had a real need, a drink of water, but there was a much deeper need for her withered and thirsty soul. She needed someone to see her. She desperately needed someone to acknowledge her worth. And this happens so much in the story of Jesus. We're looking for one thing, but he understands that deep down, there's something else that we need so much more. She started out looking for water, but what she needed was to be rescued from her circumstances and decisions. She needed the same thing we all need, the wellspring of life that only Jesus can bring.
I would get up in the morning, I would smoke a bowl, a couple bowls of meth, right? And then I would go to work and take the kids to school, you know, stuff like that, um, go to their games. I would work all day and then come home and drink to go to sleep and eat so that I didn't look skinny or anything, you know? And then um, I smoke a bowl all day long. Meth was the cure-all. It was the end-all. It was, um, yeah, I, I used meth for 14 years solid every day. So the day that I met Sarah, I actually went to Coldwell Park. It's a park in Redding, California. I remember I was laying there on the, in the grass in Caldwell Park, and I seen Caleb and a bunch of people walking up, kind of little group with him, you know? And um, <laughs> I looked that way and I said, oh man, here come these crazy church people. They're gonna try and pray for us. I know it. Uh, he kept saying, you're awesome. You're, you know, God thinks you're awesome. And I was like, this guy's nuts. He's, <laughs> he's crazy. I don't, how can he be so positive, right? Well, he said to me, uh, you guys need anything, anything ever, do you just take down my number and call me? And um, I put it in my phone. And I put crazy church guy, you know, and um, in the number. And I thought, I'm never gonna need him for anything, but in case I do, you know, I don't know why something in the back of my head was like, you need that, you know? You, you need someone to tell you that you're awesome. And, um, no one's ever told me that, you know. So about two or three months after Sarah and I met at the park, I got a text message. It was like, hey, I'm a drug addict. I'm homeless. I'm done with life. I want to kill myself. I'm like, all right, I'm going to pick you up and we're going to go out to breakfast. I'm going to treat you to breakfast. So when Caleb came to get me to have breakfast, it was empowering. I. I can't explain what it's like. I, I don't even know the words to say. I just asked Sarah, like, who is she? And she told me her her story. And he did keep saying, you're amazing. I, I want to hear your story. You know, I want to know how you feel and just let me come to you. And I was just encouraging her. I'm like, you're incredible to have gone through what you've gone through and to be the person that you are today. It made me feel better. It made me want to do something with it. One night, I decided to go to Bethel. They had been praying over me for a while, and um, I was like, okay, I'm gonna go. And so Sarah's like, well, you know, I was there, and I'm really freaked out, and I'm really scared, and I'm just really nervous, and I'm just like, what in the world is going on? And she starts encountering the love of God. And as she's on the ground encountering the love of God, she's cussing about like what the F is going on, what the blankety blank. I didn't think that that God was loving. I always thought he was hateful. So I had to rediscover him all over again. I was using all the time, all the time. The night before I used, I just asked him to pray over me. You gotta, you guys gotta help me get this job so I can get off these drugs. I don't, I don't know how I'm gonna do it, you know? And someone came up and said, I'm gonna pray for all the toxins to leave your body. And I tested and I tested clean. So after I got the job at Walmart and um, I got a place in Corning, that's when I relapsed. There was a lot of regrets. Um, it's really hard to, um, you can't undo that, you know? You can't undo the harm that you've done to your family, your kids, or yourself. I knew at that point I'd have to ask God for help. There was no other way. And they put me in a program. On November 24th this year, I'll be three years clean and sober. So that's pretty rewarding. So now, I graduated drug court. Um, I work at Right Road DUI five days a week. Um, I have my kids. I take them to school. So five days a week, I I counsel people, help them get their driver's license back. So to look back now on my life, 
I can see where God was trying to reach out to me. I wasn't paying attention. On several different occasions I had people approach me and try and talk to me about God and I turned them away. I think he had to send me Caleb to really get me to notice what was going on. What it's like for me to witness what happened in Sarah's life is, I'm gonna cry because it overwhelms me. To, to see someone know God, to see someone above knowing him experience love, true love, there's nothing like Jesus, there's nothing like his love. So it was important for me to feel valued because I don't hear that every day. To be told that you have worth is a lot. Maybe it might not stick in everybody else's head, but for me it was. For me, it was in the back of my head ticking always that he thought I was amazing, that God thought I was amazing. When I found out the heart of God, I, I found out that God really likes people and God doesn't see junk. He sees treasure in the midst of dirt telling people that, hey, you are amazing, hey, you are capable, not just to say it because that's actually the truth. It doesn't matter what you're doing. It doesn't matter who you are. He's always there. People need to know that. People like me who didn't um, get shown that. He loves everybody. That's what I want my kids to know. That's what I want everybody to know. He loves you.